This video is inspired by a uh, piece in the uh, opinion section of the New York Times that I recently read. It was posted on Facebook. Uh, the title of the piece is The Meritocracy Against Itself by a guy named Ross Dothit. I'm not familiar with this author. I don't uh, uh, systematically read the New York Times or its opinion page. Um, but I like this uh, article. Basically, it was about how a lot of the people who have been writing about the Kavanaugh hearings uh, uh, we'll talk about things like that he's privileged, that he's a, a preppy elite, um, you know, prep school kid who went to a good school, and that he's just this aloof, uh, upper class, not, not upper, upper class uh, jock, not upper classman in the sense that he's a, a senior versus a freshman, but upper class in the sense that he's from um, the polished uh, social upper class elite. And the point of the article is that almost everybody who writes these articles are themselves uh, super privileged. And there's one uh, one quick quote that really stuck out to me in the, in the article. So he references uh, an article by uh, somebody named Miller, I can't remember the full name here, who uh, you know relates a story that she apparently knew somebody who knew Kavanaugh when he was in college, uh, and she wrote an entire story about you know what an upper-class jockey is, and uh, just, so he writes here, so the story Miller is telling is about how a jock from the number five private high school in Maryland was a jerk to his roommate who went to the number two private high school in Connecticut, and who years later communicated the story to a reporter who also went to the number two private high school, who then wrote it up as a tale of social stratification for our times. Okay, so this uh, reminds me of a topic that I've actually covered a little bit before. I made a video a couple years ago about St. Paul's School. Uh, St. Paul's School is an elite prep school in New Hampshire that I had no knowledge of prior to moving here. I only became aware of it because students there started hitting me up on Grindr through talking to them uh, in the normal dialogue. Uh, you know, I found out where they went to school and found it interesting and ended up reading a couple books about it. And uh, if you go back, I think the actual title of that video is Privilege, and the title of the book that I read about St. Paul's School is also Privilege. I read this book maybe three years ago by Seamus Rahman Khan, who was a teacher there and a, and a former student from St. Paul's School. And I think that this article kind of rekindled a lot of uh, and demonstrated and showed a lot of what this book and and schools like that and the Ivy League kind of perpetuate. So what he talks about in this book is how uh, you can't go to a school like that unless you are privileged, okay? No child who is 13, 14 uh, earns enough money that they could possibly pay their tuition to go to a school like St. Paul School or Groton or Exeter or the number two school in Connecticut or the number three school in New York or any of these other uh, elite prep schools, uh, unless, I mean, maybe the highest paid child actors in Hollywood make enough that they could do it. Um, not that any of them would waste their time attending such a school since they're making so much money, but no 13 or 14 year old could actually um, work hard enough to earn a spot here, at least uh, not as a general policy. The schools are filled with super rich kids and legacies. Right, so there's privilege either of class and wealth or, or of uh, uh, of association of having gone there before, or literally of heredity, and usually both, uh, both legacy and, and, and money. And then what the schools do, though, is they don't only, they're not completely con uh, filled with students like that. That's the majority of the class. That's who's paying the bills. That's uh, what they are guard uh, really servicing. But then they will go and give scholarships to students who aren't necessarily wealthy. Um, and those students do tend to be really gifted. So you have a school that's uh, very elite and very highly ranked. Uh, there's a little bit of a vicious circle there in terms of the ranking that I'll go into in a little bit. Um, and it's full of basically super rich, super privileged kids. Uh, and at some point, that kind of wears thin. Why are you accomplished? Why are you important? Well, because you went to a, a rich school. Is it a good school? You know, what makes it so good? Well, they'll go and they'll find people who are truly talented, who are truly intelligent, who are truly accomplished and hardworking, and give them scholarships. And so you get this veneer 
of uh, the super elite, um, highest, highest functioning, most scholarly kids. And, and I've met people like that too. You know, this is a, a kind of an unforeseen um, development when I moved here. You know, I moved to New Hampshire for the Free State Project and I love New Hampshire for a whole host of reasons. And it didn't occur to me that I would basically be moving almost in the center of the private boarding school, Ivy League elite. That's something that being from the Midwest was a completely alien culture. I, I don't know of any boarding schools in Michigan. There are some uh, private schools. Certainly, they tend to be Catholic schools. Uh, I think it's even even among private schools, I think it's less than something like 80% of them are Catholic. And then the, there's 20% that are not, but it's very small. And some of them are elite athletically and are certainly good schools as far as schools go, but they're not elite. They don't have the, the children of uh, nationally elite people anyway. They might have local elites, maybe the mayor's children or representatives um, in, in say the state house or city officials. But even then, a lot of times those kids will probably go to public schools or, or maybe, um, you know, maybe a, a local Catholic school. But I didn't know anybody who'd gone to an Ivy League school. I didn't know anybody and going to a prep school, and I only knew about them from movies. So if you watch, like, say, the Dead Poet Society is probably the greatest example here, but there's a couple others that you could go to. You would watch them in movies, and it would be this completely alien uh, world where I wasn't even sure, like, if that was real or if that was just Hollywood, or this would be almost kind of like um, similar uh, to, like, the military academy. So if you watch a film like Taps, you're like, wow, are there, are there actually places where kids go and are, are like wear uniforms and march and train with rifles like is that is that a, a hollywood affectation or an exaggeration of reality or an accurate representation that's how i thought about prep schools and ivy league schools and the projection about especially the ivy leagues i don't think there was so much there's so much cultural um, baggage associated with prep schools as there are the ivy leagues but the idea was you know the people who go there are are just the most competent, the most intelligent, the most successful, the most hardworking. You know, just basically the most high functioning people, the most worthy people in our society. And the idea you always hear how difficult it was to get into Harvard, and you thought, well, it's difficult because they're selective and they um, and they uh, only take the best of the best of the best. So like you might be the smartest guy at your high school, but there's no way you could get into Harvard and. And even, even if you were the smartest guy in the whole state or the best this or the best that, you probably aren't good. And that's the projection that they create. And there is a kernel of truth to that in the sense that um, if you're not able to pay, if you can't pay the cost and you're not a legacy, then and, and well-connected in that sense, then it is indeed very difficult to get in. If you're trying to get the scholarship money, if you're trying to um, get in without having the uh, advantage and the privilege of having had parents or grandparents or whatever entire families that have gone, then yes, it's very difficult to get into schools like Harvard. And when you throw into the mix the fact that they are um, selectively doing that based on criteria that is not based on merit because they have all kinds of affirmative action and not, not in the most... Um, not in the most blatant, I mean, some of it is blatant, some of it's not blatant. You know, a lot of the schools, they like to have a spread of people from different areas. And so, you know, they don't want too many people coming from, uh, say, Massachusetts because there's too many people from Massachusetts. So, you know, if you're the smartest person in Wyoming, you might have a better shot than, say, the smartest person from California because there's a lot of smart people from California and Wyoming looks good on the map or if you're from another country or whatever. So, they bring in the veneer of the of the most um, academically gifted, uh, brilliant students, uh, and then project that's what everyone is. But that's not true. Most of the people, uh, like they have standards, so they're not ex necessarily going to accept accept you know um, elite children who are completely complete fuck ups who are totally idiots. Uh, that's what Tufts is for. Tufts is where the elite children go who are just too stupid to get into to Harvard. Um, but <laughs> some, some Tufts is going to watch this and not like it, but you know, that's how it is. Uh, but you know, having now met, having moved here, it just completely demystified these institutions. Uh, and the fact that I learn about them by meeting people who go there, uh, meeting in the dorms, getting, getting tours, interacting with them. Uh, interacting with people who teach there, interacting with people who go there, undergraduates, graduates, it's completely de demystified them. And I've met both, okay? I've met people who were uh, 
the the uber elite who uh you know one of the guys i met and i've referenced him before he you know he was his roommate was tom dashell's son he was a millionaire he he spent his time with millionaires and billionaires uh with people who speak the boston brahmin if you're familiar with it which is a dialect of the uh super elite of beacon hill in boston who you know they always have houses on martha's vineyard or cape cod or nantucket uh, and they speak with a different accent. If you ever listen to it, Bill Weld speaks with this accent. But then when they go and they hang out with the plebs, uh, they speak with a normal Boston accent uh, and, you know, kind of pretend to be, um, you know, of that level. Uh, and then, but then they're connected and they're wealthy and they're as as privileged as you can be other than perhaps royalty. So maybe Prince Harry and Prince William are higher up on the privilege spectrum than they are, but that's pretty much it. Uh, and in terms of like wealth, that may not even be true. That we can get into debate on the wealth of the royal family or whatnot, but, uh, and then you have other people who aren't necessarily privileged, aren't necessarily wealthy, but who are academically very gifted and very intelligent and very hardworking. And I've met people like that too. One of the guys that I met, actually the, the one who introduced me to St. Paul's school, he's from a small town in the middle of nowhere. His his parents have normal lower middle class. His other siblings all went to public schools and local community colleges and local schools and have normal jobs. And he was just very, very bright, very good, very good athlete, very hard worker, spoke multiple languages. He got a scholarship to go to St. Paul's and his entire hope of, of going there and he now goes to Harvard. Um, is he just wants to get a good job. He's obsessed with just getting a good job and like making a good living, a decent living. That's what he wants. He's not fixated on ruling the world. And, you know, I actually asked him about this. I was like, it sounds like you are the, 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 the mask or the veneer that they like to pretend everyone at the school is like, but that the reality is it's basically for rich kids who are not necessarily all stupid. And if you're talking about the Ivy Leagues, they aren't typically going to accept stupid gays, although I assume that they make exceptions for people who are well-connected enough. Uh, and because the ones that I met, like, so I, I, the other people I met at Harvard, you know, they weren't dumb. They, they were intelligent people. Uh, and, but their resumes, if they, if they had made that resume in Ohio or Nebraska, there's no way it would have gotten them to Harvard. But since they were from Long Island and both of their parents went to Harvard and they were on the rowing team, because, you know, that's something Harvard values a lot. And if you don't live in New England, try and find anyone who's on a rowing team um uh you know their their qualification levels academically were completely different you know uh, one of them spoke multiple languages uh was a total nerd spent all of his time reading was deeply deeply thoughtful and, and and intellectually curious and the other one was obsessed with fashion and where the best clubs were and and what to do on saturday night and Yes, he was urbane and he was sophisticated in his speech and in his dress, which he really greatly emphasized how you have to look good and dress well. Uh, and he looked at Harvard as not an opportunity to maybe get a good job later, but, oh, this is where you meet all the people who are worth knowing. These are where you meet all the people who are smart and all the people who are well-connected. And then you socialize with them at cocktail parties and at the yacht club. Uh, so completely different. Uh, and the projection is of the of the student of the, who's just super um, academically gifted and not of a rich kid. And here's the here's the interesting thing about the elites in the United States. Uh, historically, elites have uh, flaunted their elitism, flaunted their status, flaunted that they're that they're wealthier, that they have a higher status in life. And this is very clear throughout historical. Europe, where you have the nobility and you have this hierarchy, and well, you know, you have the royalty, and then you have the upper nobility, the dukes, and then you go down and you're in the barons, and all the way down to the knights and the yeomanry. And it's all, you know, there's all these titles associated and all these accoutrements of status, and that was how most of human society has, has been, you know, historically. The idea that you are humble. Uh, that you pretend to be of the people. That has happened. There are examples of that um, in, in historically in things that are like republics and democracies. So you could get that in ancient Greece. You could get that in ancient Rome. Or you might have people saying, oh, I'm not, I'm not necessarily a sophisticated family from an ancient line uh, from one of the Julian hills in Rome. 
you had that, but then you also had people who kind of played the pleb. And we're getting that in a big way in the United States. And I don't know when it started. I don't know if it's been here all along. It's possible. There is no question that it has puritanical roots in it because this is all coming straight from Yankee New England. And this idea of, um, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't have status just because you're wealthy. But the elites want, they want to give status to their children. So they've created institutions of high status, basically the prep schools and the Ivy Leagues. Uh, and these, and I've talked about this in other videos, uh, but those exist to convey status intergenerationally among affluent, well, well-heeled um, New England elites, basically. And then also to bring in elites from other parts of the country and indeed the world and assimilate them into their culture. So the richest people in, Colo in, in California will say, well, where's the most, where's the highest status? You know, you can go to a good school. There are good schools in California and there's a certain amount of status that you can get in California. And it's not an, it's not an ins insignificant amount, but it, it's not the same as Harvard or Yale. It's not the same as the Ivy League. All right. It doesn't have quite that much. Now, you know, not that many uh, alumni from uh, UC Berkeley uh, became president or have become senators or have won Nobel Prizes, but like Harvard and Yale, Dartmouth, Princeton, Brown, they, they have that, especially Harvard and Yale. Uh, and the same with the prep schools. And so they send their kids there. So another person that I talked to who went to St. Paul School, he was not academically interest. He didn't care. He was a normal, angsty, super horny high school kid who did not care. He didn't like to read. He didn't like to learn. He wasn't intellectually curious. He wanted to skateboard. He wanted to smoke pot. But his parents were super wealthy. He was from California. And they said, well, we want you to have the accoutrements of status and wealth and so they sent him to st paul's and he didn't get into st paul's because he outcompeted, you know hundreds or thousands of super intelligent students it's because he was rich and he could pay for the tuition so they let him in so they let him in but then he gets to by association get the uh the 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 intellectual status of of the scholarship students uh, who don't come from his position. So uh, it's it's really quite it's quite an effective system. But then the other thing that they teach at St. Paul School, and it's why it's, it's named this, is they teach them, they teach the students, the fact that you're here and the fact that this is such a great school, that means that you've earned your situation, you've earned your status, that um, Yes, maybe you are rich, but St. Paul's is a hard school. It's the, you know, whatever ranked first, second, fifth, I, I don't know, you know, prep school in the country. And you got in here. And so that means that you are, you have achieved for yourself. And the thing is, academically, if you can afford it in your legacy, the requirements to get in are not that high. Uh, there are standards so like i said it's not if you're a complete fuck up you may not be able to get in but once you get in very few students drop out or leave st paul school there's a very high graduation rate so it's not like it's so intellectually demanding that the attrition rate is 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 egregious a normal student a normal good student at least from anywhere would if they were in st paul school would pass the classes and then they'd have a, at least a 30% chance of going to Harvard and a 30% chance of going to Yale and a 100% chance nearly of going to any Ivy League school you want because the programs at St. Paul's School and other schools like it are catered to create an Ivy League resume. And even more important than that, probably, they are basically direct feeder schools. When St. Paul's School calls Harvard and goes, here's our graduating class, Harvard's going to accept a lot of those people. When the counselors at St. Paul's School say, hey, this is Billy, Billy wants to go to Harvard, blah, 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 they listen to him. And they're probably on a first name basis with the counselors, and there's more than one at places like St. Paul's or Groton or Exeter or Andover. Uh, whereas that's not going to be true if a counselor, say, from uh, New Mexico calls and says, hey, we've got this great student, they're the Valedictorian, they did X, Y, and Z. And they're going to say, yeah, 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 New Mexico person, 
we get this from everybody. We turn down uh, 40 Val Victorians for every person we admit. Blah 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 blah. Now there are certain things in the resume. I mean, you can get in if you're from other from far away and you don't have those connections. It's just a lot harder. There's a much higher uh, burden. It's much easier for you to go to one of these prep schools. I mean, for Christ's sake, half the people at Harvard probably themselves went to St. Paul's School. So it's like, oh yeah, another bring in another. Uh, what's their mascot? I think it's the Trojans, oh, or something like that. Uh, the Knights maybe. Uh, so you know, th there's this. They're inculcated with the idea that you've earned all this and that you've worked. The, the, re the reason that you are successful is because you've worked hard and not because mommy and daddy paid $30,000 a year for you to go here. I think it might even be more than that at St. Paul's School. Uh, and you got in because you're a legacy, largely, if not exclusively. Uh, and then they leave with a sense that, you know, that their status is earned, that they, they really are they look out and they're like i am actually smarter than everyone else not every you know and it's silly too because the vast majority of people don't attempt to go to a school like that so it's not like you're out competing everybody say like in the olympics like michael phelps has has raced against all the swimmers in the world essentially if you go through all all the pre prelims and everything and he's beat them all so yes he he's achieved something magnet or not just him anyone who gets to that level uh, because you go to the number one school doesn't mean you beat all the kids in all the other schools because the vast majority of the kids in the other school won't even apply to your school. So you're only competing against the ones who apply, and that's a small list, relatively speaking. You know, you're you're out competing, you're in the, you're in the whatever on top of that, and that's a, that's a select minority. And so you end up with these kids who are supremely privileged. They're as privileged as you can be. The most privileged people in history, more or less. Uh, if if not individually, then as a class, who believe that they are just hardworking, blue-collar, uh, pull-up-from-their-bootstraps people. And you see this a lot. I've, I've heard Jonathan Haidt talk about this, especially in reference to the outrageous videos from Yale, where you have these students who feel like that they're victims, that they're, um, that they're being oppressed, and it's like, no, you go to Yale. You're not being oppressed, and there might be, there might be, there there is a very small, a very small sliver of a percentage of people who go to a school like that who aren't wealthy and who aren't well connected, but you know, achieved enough that they were able to be one of the scholarship students or one of the students who who got in on their own academic merits. Uh, although even that is very, almost always an indication of wealth and privilege because the things that they look for, the way to build a resume that an Ivy League school likes and will will admit to is not entirely, but almost entirely a function of wealth, right? So you, that you have attributes that are almost impossible to achieve otherwise. So a uh, classic example, and there's another great book on this. If you're interested, that I've also covered creating the class, college admissions, and the education of the elite, which I did another video on. Very good book, where he talks about in that, for instance, that you know, um, you know, all these Ivy League schools they have swim teams and they'll give scholarships to kids who uh, are really good swimmers. And I, um, the, the, where I live, the gym that I go to has a swim team, and it's a really good swim team. And the whole, and I think I've heard that, you know, parents pay something like $5,000 a year to have their kids be on that swim team. Uh, and why do they do that? Well, because there's an expectation that if they get really good, uh, that they could potentially get a scholarship. And indeed, every year, some of the seniors on that team, when they graduate, they do get scholarships and they'll go to places. I don't know any who have gone to the Ivy League, but, you know, Notre Dame, West Point, uh, University of Indiana, there's a couple... You know when they come back, so I know where they where they've gone. Uh, but you know, some of them hypothetically could end up going to an Ivy League school and get on the get a get a swimming scholarship to Harvard. And it's like, oh well, he he earned it on his own. It's like he earned like to be a swimmer at that level. Me basically requires the oversight of an expert, the paid oversight of an expert. Year after year after year after year after year. Mike, Michael Phelps is very talented and worked very hard, but he had a coach that entire time 
and that was not cheap. Who knows how much his parents paid for that to happen. Now you get to a certain level and he's not paying for it anymore and so you get to a certain level of success. But to get into school, that no one gets to that that point. So, you know, if let's say, you know, one of the kids from my gym gets into Dartmouth on a swimming scholarship and then says, well, look, I earned it because I'm a hard worker. And it's like, you earned it because mommy and daddy paid $5,000 a year for 10 years uh, for you to acquire that education and acquire that skill. And the thing is, the elite colleges look for things like that. And it's not, just, you know, whether it's rowing, small boat sailing, polo, rugby, I mean, even football, hockey, these are expensive, expensive sports. These are investments. Families have to invest a ton to get into them uh, at that to that level, typically. Obviously, you have people who maybe their circumstances are such that they are able to train without spending a lot of money or their physical abilities are just so off the charts that they are able to get to that level without as much training as may other, an average person might need to get to the same level. So there are exceptional cases, cer certainly. Uh, but so even among the students who aren't legacies and who aren't necessarily wealthy, um, or at least elite wealthy, upper middle class, it took a huge investment of money just to get them there. Now, I guess you can be pedantic and argue this way. Well, even if you're not a swimmer, like somebody was paying for your food, but it costs a lot for a child to get a person to the, the age of 18 takes a decent resource investment, you know, regardless of your class. Uh, but we have to bear that in mind before we start, you know, assuming that these people are, are really like our betters. And it's, it's so weird. They like to pretend that, oh yeah, we're, we're for the common people and we're, uh, you know, we're not that sophisticated and we work hard. We're not just, we're just not an aloof elite. But then I did go to Harvard. So honestly, I should rule the country. I mean, that, that is what they believe. By and large, there's very few of them who take the view, at least if they're politically engaged. I'm sure there's plenty who don't care about politics or maybe even apathetic. But to the extent that they do care about politics, they think, I know what's best for everybody, and I worked hard and I earned it, and I'm, I am the elite of the elite. Who are you to question me? I went to fucking Harvard. I went to Yale. I went to fucking St. Paul School. You know, Morgan, uh, Jim Carrey went to my high school. Did Jim Carrey go to your high school? Fuck you. Not Jim Carrey. Um, who's the senator? John Kerry, sorry. But even Jim Kerry, I mean, he's famous, so that would count too. So, um, it's kind of funny. Uh, yeah, these people are, in general, and the overwhelming majority of the time, exceptionally privileged. Exceptionally privileged. And usually exceptionally wealthy also. And the ones who are not, who are actually exceptional in terms of academic achievement and not necessarily of wealth they're exceptional in the sense that they're the veneer they're the co coating they're the, the the cover uh that then is projected out and so we get these new england elites from these old families whether it be the kennedys or the welds or whoever else uh who can perpetuate this forever and ever and they see it as their right to rule over the fucking I mean, some of them over the world, but at the very least over the United States. Uh, and they are, they have absolute antipathy and acrimony to any kind of counter pole, any other counter center of, of status. Um, and they bitterly, bitterly resent um, any attempt for them to lose power, which is a, another thing that I think we're seeing with Kavanaugh. I'm going to do a whole, whole video about this, but I just saw uh, one of my uh, liberal relatives post that um, we should now pack the Supreme Court, you know, because fuck any pretense of democracy, we want to rule. And if we can't rule with the nine justices who are on the Supreme Court, well, we should appoint more to get to ram through. And I see this sentiment increasingly happening. Uh, I will devote an entire video to this because it is interesting. Um, of people who disagree with us really ought to be disenfranchised like we don't we should you know abolish the electoral college abolish the supreme court as it is abolish uh you know google and facebook and youtube they should do everything in their power to thwart um the cooperation organization and motivation of 
uh, their political enemies, which are essentially half the country, uh, and do everything in their power to support their their ideology. Um, there is between the election of Trump and you know his his appointments to the Supreme Court, there is this visceral hatred for a process that they have lost at, even though it's a temporary loss, right? There's no question that we'll have another Democratic president. There's no question that the Democrats, whether it's this election or the next one, will make gains in the House and the Senate and will be able to appoint Supreme Court justices in the future. There's no question. But even putting on the brakes for a little bit, even even thwarting them like temporarily, enrages and angers them to the point that they're completely apoplectic. And I mean, yeah, they're going to pack the court. What happens when the next Republican comes in and appoints 20 new justices to undo that? Like, fuck are they thinking? But that's what they believe. And th and that's what they've been inculcated to believe. You are, you are the, you're the hardest working, the smartest, the most accomplished because you went here. Never mind the fact that daddy went here and grandpa went here and they're paying thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year for you to go here, for you to ace classes on medieval literature that... Again, any good student and anywhere in the country would be able to ace. So, anyway, anyone while I'll try and put a link in the in the description to the article that I read. It's a, overall a decent arg article and relatively good in terms of self-reflection on the part of the author. I don't know what his stances are on anything else, but uh, yeah, to have these people uh, criticizing privilege and criticizing the elite and the fucking patriarchy or whatever it is when they are themselves at at the, at the pinnacle of our society and have been since fucking birth is is uh, insufferably arrogant and ironic. So anyway, I will talk to you all later and have a good day.